I'm frightened. Doing this together and head back. Okay, it has been long enough, so let's bring Superman back. It's probably what these guys said when Pa Kent was given his out-of-body experience in funeral for a friend. So let's now talk about how Superman was brought back to life. But before that, we need to focus on the replacements that rose in his place while he was gone. A ton of rubble! Doomsday! Where's Doomsday? John Henry Irons, the Man of Steel, whom we know better these days as Just Steel, was a construction worker rescued by Superman when he tried to save a co-worker, and as thanks for saving his life, Superman simply asked John Henry to make his life count for something. So, after Superman died while fighting Doomsday, John Henry decided to do exactly that by using his engineering skills to create an exoskeleton, to be like the prophet in crisis while carrying a big hammer like his namesake, and go after the gangs using Toastmaster weapons that he had himself designed when he was still working for the US military. <laughs> Get away from that woman. What the hell? Hell. I have seen hell, fool. Put down that gun or I will send you there. The last son of Krypton was presented as a form of energy that stole Superman's remains from his grave, implied to be possessing it, and then went around as a Superman that people on the left end of the scale probably still claim that Henry Cavill was portraying in Zack Snyder's DCEU movies. Calling himself the last son of Krypton, he then set up shop in the Fortress of Solitude, where he periodically returned to recharge himself. And Guy Gardner ended up approving him as the new Superman for now. Lois, I thought we had a deal. You know, I save the world, you write it up, we both end up on page one of the planet. Who the heck? But no, no, I get page six. The Metropolis Kid, who doesn't want to be called Superboy, was a clone created by Project Cadmus from what they were able to cut out from Superman's remains before being forced to return them to his tomb. The Newsboy Legion helped him escape, and when Superboy, as he would later be called anyway, then made his debut, he would end up acting like a social media influencer by having his heroics be televised and reported by a reporter close to his own physical age, named Tana Moon for WGBS, whom he literally picked up from the streets. Long story short, this was the earliest version of the Connor Kent Superboy, whom most of you might recognize from the Young Justice cartoon. Burr, aren't you? Yes, I'm Superman. I'm back. And then there was this guy, dubbed as the Man of Tomorrow, who showed up claiming to be amnestic, but saying the right things to be bought as the real deal. Even getting the approval of the president after stopping an attack on the White House, and he also broke into Cadmus for Doomsday's remains to throw it into space. So, those were the four Superman replacements that started to fly around after Pa Kent brought Clark's soul back from the afterlife in his out-of-body experience. And all of them were more or less busy with their own stuff, with still going after the gangs in the suicide slums, while also crossing paths with Superboy to lecture him about not showing off while lives are at stake. It worked well enough to have the two work briefly together to hunt down who was to fly in the gangs with Toastmaster weapons, while Luthor also tried to propose them to his side with his Supergirl servant. And of course Lois Lane, who was not only still a morning for Clark's death tried to figure out which one of those four was the man she had loved. Still obviously being John Henry Irons told her that he never claimed to be Superman. The, these other guys, they're all calling themselves Superman. So? What about you? I never said that I was Superman. Superboy outright let everyone know through Tana that he is a clone without implanted memories. Last son outright denied being Clark Kent anymore by claiming that the death had changed him. I know that we were more than friends. You were engaged to marry Clark Kent. He loved you very much. He trusted you completely, even with the secret of his double life. Then you are... I am. Sorry. I grieve for your loss, Miss Lane. What are you saying? If it's really you, Clark... No. We must not speak of this again. 
Clark is gone. There is only Superman now. Wait! Dear God in heaven, if he's lying, someone learned Clark was Superman. And if he's telling the truth, I, I've lost Clark all over again. And the cyborg, like I previously said, presented himself as an amnestic with fractured memories that were enough to imply that he could have been the resurrected Superman. I can't remember. So much of the memory has gone, but it is me. Oh, uh-huh. Well, that's pretty convenient. Anybody can put on a blue suit and pretend to be Superman. Try and tell me something only he could know. There are snippets. Uh, a farm in Kansas. The, the name Kent. Uh, I want to remember. I, I want to know. You're doing pretty good so far. Oh, and Bibbo also decided to go around as a small-time Superman replacement with some modest success, which included rescuing a puppy that became the post-crisis version of Crypto the Superdog before the actual Crypto the Superdog showed up. Other points worth mentioning are how Maggie Sawyer got promoted from a captain into an inspector, and Ron Troop got Clark Kent's job in his absence after covering how the man of tomorrow saved the president. Alright, that is all the needed setup before the story commentary can start. When I went through the story with Robert on his channel, he told me that it's best to be started from somewhere around here between Adventures of Superman issue 502 and Action Comics issue 689, where Superboy and Supergirl fighting a made-up supervillain hired by the WGBS on a bridge coast to happen, with Tana being aware of her bosses at WGBS having arranged the fight in the first place, and she was so partly responsible for it. At the same time, an alien ship is shown to be approaching Earth with hostile intentions. And that is about 200 pages into almost 500 scans that Robert sent me for editing. So the story commentary actually starts two-fifths in. And here's the time code where the review starts. While Tana is reporting about how Superboy and Supergirl are working to save who they can from the destroyed bridge's ruins, the regeneration's matrix that the last son of Krypton has been using to recharge his powers at the Fortress of Solitude cracks open and releases on another Superman that the Fortress robots acknowledge as their master, which so makes it clear that this is the real Superman now back to life. The robots show him what has happened to the world in his absence, and how it has been filled with his replacements. After hearing about the Last Sun's negative response from the Metropolis PD, Superman understands that he has to return to Metropolis. Back over there, Superboy and Supergirl have managed to save who they can from the bridge explosion's aftermath, and their friendly parting of ways getting televised gives Lex Luthor and another reason to be mad, along with how Superboy has signed up to have his rival Rex Leach as his PR manager. Later we have Steel confronting gangs at the suicide slums, where the last son uses extreme prejudice to save him from being shot to the back. This leads to them arguing about the use of force Superman would use, and Steel calling the last son as a cold-blooded fraud, which then leads to them fighting each each other and draw a crowd which includes Lois and Jimmy, who manage to get them to stop up until a representative of Rex Leach arrives to accuse them of trademark infringement by wearing the S shield. Steel manages to pull Last Sun from doing more than just destroying the seas and desist papers, which then leads to them fighting again above Metropolis in the sky. In space, we see that spaceship approach Earth and the silhouette of the villain traveling on it, before they fall down to Coast City, where Steel continues to try beating sense into the Last Sun, who seems to be stunned by the confusion of how Steel is beating 
beating him without acknowledging which one of them is the stronger one. During the beating, Steel ends up destroying the last son's visor, so he ends up retreating when the arriving police vehicles lights damage his eyes, and tells Steel to protect Metropolis in his absence. And with them both absent, the gangs armed with Toastmasters are confronted by Luthor's own team, who revels in the thought of having made Steel look bad by doing his job better. And Luthor also cuts a deal with the arms dealer selling the Toastmasters to the gangs, to know where and when he has agreed to have Steel arrive back to Metropolis. Luckily Steel has managed to keep his exoskeleton in the same shape as Prophet and Alcatraz to properly put up a fight against the gang and its metahuman whom... And with that, Steel grabs the arms dealer, whose street name is White Rabbit by the way, and whom Steel makes to lead him to where the weapons are stashed. Long story short, she has a bomb in there as a trap from which Steel manages to escape from, but the White Rabbit is caught into it while trying to flee from him. So concludes that arc in the story, and the alien ship is now orbiting our moon if the narration is to be believed. But now that it's also shooting orbital satellites, people like Lex Luthor now know that it's up there in space. So it might as well land over Coast City and start asserting dominance by firing 77,000 spears that the Man of Tomorrow randomly accuses the Last Sun for being aligned with. Just because he happens to still be in Coast City. The last sun trees the cyborg's accusations with the attention they deserve, but that only causes him to be shot to the back as those spears detonate and level down Ghost City, which the cyborg Superman confesses that he wants it to happen while framing the last sun for it. The last sun is reduced in the explosions into his energy form, while the alien overlord in the ship releases more spheres into the ground that used to be Ghost City, to grow up into an engine city that the cyborg Superman reports back to White House to still be a crater left by the explosion. He is so revealed to be the main antagonist of the story by approaching the alien alien overlord in the ship, who is not only revealed to be Mongul, but also to be working under the cyborg Superman as his underling. That's a twist. That's very twisty. Sometime after that, the cyborg Superman is shown dealing with a handful of survivors by The rogue Superman is unstoppable. He... There, he's behind you! Where? I don't see anything on the face. I said, he's behind you! and then reports his actions as having put down wounded animals, before requesting for Superboy to be sent as his backup partner. During this same time, the last sun in its energy form has reached the Fortress of Solitude, where a Kryptonian warsuit carrying Superman has set its course towards Metropolis. The WGBS is so contacted, and Tana is told to pull Superboy from playing video games, and told to go rendezvous with the cyborg Superman in the ruins of Ghost City, and to be careful, because he is her only friend. It is a good thing that Tana was told not to go with him, because the news crew that gets sent with Superboy ends up Die out there, don't come! Superboy says, I got this, I'll protect them! And then blows them up! You, you used your heat fashion too, but we said we protect them! I said I protect them, and I said they die in here! Superman always keeps his word. And then the cyborg Superman begins to beat up Superboy just like how he beat up the last son. Then during their fight we get a glimpse of the tactical telekinesis that Superboy also has, but was not verified on what it is at this point, while the observing Mongol just watches with hopes that he could get back in charge. Superboy still gets beaten up and taken captive into the engine city to learn the horrifying truth of how the cyborg Superman has Mongol working for him. 
By now, the last son has managed to reach inside the fortress to learn how its regeneration matrix is empty, and its contents that could have charged his powers is already on its way towards the action. Back in the States, the cyborg Superman has been using an early version of AI footage to generate false evidence to frame the last son for Ghost City's destruction and to make Superboy appear like his lapdog. And because this is the 1990s when the concept of AI generated footage was not a thing, it is convincing enough to fool the Justice League to go on a wild goose chase off the planet just because the cyborg Superman said so. In the middle here, we get told the Last Sun's origin story, while the Fortress robots try to restore him back to full strength with alternative methods. I might as well switch to calling him the Eradicator at this point, as that is who he originally was when Superman faced off against him as a Kryptonian AI that had kept the Kryptonian society as isolationists by forcing them to stay on the planet when it was... You know what? I think Robert covered that story with Yaren some time ago, so feel free to go watch that video for a longer explanation. Anyway, here it is spelled out that the Eradicator stole Superman's remains from his tomb and kept Superman as his power charger in the fortress. Superman on his end is being taken on a pre-programmed ride on the Kryptonian war suit while being both dead and blind the route he is being taken on. And while the cyborg Superman is discussing about their plans with Mongul, Superboy manages to again unknowingly use his tactical telekinesis to free himself from his restraints. Then we see Lois hitting the deep end on the rebound date with this guy, which causes her to be snapped back into her senses to get back to work and decide to go to Ghost City because she doesn't trust the cyborg Superman story. If it wasn't written by a woman, I would have called this sexist. Around this time, Supergirl has also decided to go to Ghost City, but is delayed because Luthor has now gotten word about the Kryptonian war suit heading towards Metropolis. After failing to try stopping it, Supergirl rushes to where the war suit is coming to shore, which also happens to be the airport where Lois and Steel are about to take a plane to fly to Ghost City. When that happens, a lot of other things also take place, as Supergirl throws the war suit at Luthor arriving helicopter. Steel joins the fight and Superboy arrives to help putting the war suit in place. As it begins to push its pilot out. Quiet everybody, that robot, armor, whatever it is, it's opening up. <laughs> the cyborg, he's the bad guy. He's in league with an alien called Mongol. There's a giant rocket engine where Coast City used to be and Metropolis is the next target. Over my dead body. And so, Superman has made his way back to his partner, Nemesis, and two replacements. Due to him being the fifth Superman to show up, and still being too weak from having been restored back to life, causes some disbelief about his validity, but sneakily telling Lois Lane what Clark Kent's favorite movie is buys him some of her trust, before Superboy reminds them about what has happened to Ghost City. In the engine city built on its place, an altercation where Cyborg Superman needs to remind Mongul which one of them is in charge, causes the other underlings to remind themselves how this unholy alliance came to be. The Cyborg Superman used to be a NASA astronaut whose crew went through a more tragic version of the Fantastic Four's origin story, which had left all but him dead and with the power to manipulate technology. The trauma, of course, caused him to merge with too much technology to cause disturbances to Earth's communications network, which put him into a conflict with Superman and merge with the Kryptonian birth matrix before fleeing into the space. What the astronaut had been reduced into then landed on the war world, and after a long assimilation process, the cyborg eventually pulled the Look at me, sure. Look at me, sure. I'm the captain now move on to Mongul. Oh, and his real name is Hank Henshaw, and he became the cyborg Superman because... 
One, he hates Superman for having both opposed him, as well as for not having saved his space crew, and two, he had Superman's genetic code from the birth matrix to look like him. Okay, and back to Metropolis, where Superman's validity is still under questioning, which he tries to explain to Lois by... It really is me. Don't you recognize me? I'm sorry, I, I just don't know anymore. Oh. Did the others remind you of how he gave you Ma's ring for our engagement? Or, or, or about the time I told you I was really Clark? Or about that rainy day in July when we... Clark. Clark, if you're alive, tell me how. You were dead. How could you have come back? I, I don't know. I woke up in the fortress. Clark. Lois. I'll always love you. Doing and telling her what he did right before he charged to fight Doomsday one last time. Then he borrows flight boots from Luthor's crew to be able to fly to Coast City with Steel and Superboy, while his powers are still recovering. During the flight, we get a flashback from Superboy in telling Tana what the situation is to report it, and seeing Superman on the monitors flying at them causes Mongo to try and fail to take the cyborg out, as the three Supermen fly into the engine city to try fighting through the mooks. And since Superman's powers have not come back yet, he has to adapt to the circumstances in the most 90s style possible. And while they fight, the media is debating who the real Superman is now that a fifth one has popped up. Eventually, they find a huge missile like the one from the opening of Saints Row 4, which the cyborg Superman launches towards Metropolis, and Superboy decides to... ...relive the opening of Saints Row 4 by stopping it. Tana is shown reporting as it almost reaches the Daily Planet building and is redirected at the last second, and so it ends. Ing up in the middle of her reporting and she breaks down when Superboy is not shown to have survived. He does, and is somewhat winded from it. And around this time, the Fortress robots have managed to power up the Eradicator just enough to send him to join the battle as well. At the Engine City, Superman and Steel are joined by Supergirl, who sneaked out to help them as she knew Luthor would tell her not to. And so they keep fighting their way deeper into the Engine City towards Cyborg, Superman and Mongo who are used to establish that their engine city is powered up with kryptonite. Then the issue changes, and suddenly Superman and Steel are face to face with Mongul, who expositions that the engine city is set up to spin Earth out of its orbit, and that he knows that Superman is not strong enough to fight him. Superman responds to that by telling Steel to go destroy the rocket engines about to cause that, while choosing to fight Mongo with what he has, to which Steel responds by telling Superman how he saved his life and so made it count for something, which Superman remembers before he leaves to do that. That fight goes about as well as you might expect, while Steel is attacked by Cyborg Superman's technopathy controlling everything around him, and Hal Jordan is shown to be arriving from space to find his hometown destroyed soon. Eventually Supergirl steps up to assist Superman while Steel is surviving at the cost of his exosuit. Eradicator arrives to the engine city and so does Green Lantern. And it is Hull who then takes on fighting Mongul from Superman, which is not as easy as you would expect because this was still when the Green Lantern rings were still weak to the color yellow. So to compensate for that, Hull channels his anger of how his hometown is wiped out and uses it to beat up Mongul, while Superman, Steel and Supergirl have moved on to the cyborg Superman as the final boss. He takes 
takes out Steel by taking control over his exosuit while Supergirl is restrained. So Superman has to go after the cyborg with Superboy who just got back now, but has to instead go save Steel with his tactical telekinesis while the cyborg tells Superman his name. The Eradicator has now joined everyone and is given the benefit of the doubt from what Superman remembers him from, because the cyborg Superman is a bigger threat. Also while they fight to survive together, the Eradicator tells Superman that it was his death that had drawn him to Superman. Superman's body, which apparently still had a very faint pulse supported by the Earth's atmosphere, and had the Eradicator placed Superman into the Matrix Chamber any later, he would not have come back to life. Knowing he can trust the Eradicator based on that, Superman and him confront the cyborg Superman at the Engine City's kryptonite power source, which Superman seals away from hurting Superboy and Super go with steel and eradicator charges to attack cyborg superman as a payback for having framed him for ghost city Superman and Eradicator fight him together until the cyborg Superman pulls a tube out of the kryptonite chamber and aims it at Superman to kill him with the radiation, but the Eradicator takes the shot for him. Working as a filter of sorts, this causes the kryptonite radiation to have a different reaction to Superman, while Green Lantern arrives to help Supergirl, Superboy and John Henry witness how the Eradicator's sacrifice has recharged Superman Superman's powers back to what they used to be, and so Superman reduces the cyborg Superman, who had taken his shield to kill people with, into pieces of scrap metal that he can probably reconstruct himself back from. Or not, as Hal confirms that his ring can't find any traces of him, with the final boss behind them. Supergirl uses her tactical telekinesis to fix up Superman's tattered clothes into a new costume that can properly tell everyone who sees him that the real Superman is back. And the first thing he does while officially back is to go reunite with Lois, so they can next plan how to frame Clark Kent's rescue from a civil defense shelter, to both explain his absence for the previous month and a half, as well as to have photographic evidence to prove to the world that Superman and Clark Kent are two separate people. They use Supergirl to pose as Clark because this version used to have morphing powers. These days they probably had retconned it to have been Martian Manhunter. Hey herra jumala, that felt longer than it was. Even when I ended up jumping into a certain point after the replacement Superman had already been established, the way how this story was told felt unnecessarily stretched. Although I should acknowledge that the way how Superman comics were coming out in the 90s, that the last stretch of the story's climax felt like it was going for too long. And the art in those last few issues in leading up to the fight against the final boss really looked like they were drawn in a rush. The pacing was all over the climax, but now that it's out of the way, time to move on to everything else. Steel, Superboy, Eradicator and the Cyborg Superman were created replacements made for Superman's absence, as some of them were pre-existing characters or built up from previous little stories. Like that story Robert and Jared went over in how the Eradicator got set up with Hank Henshaw as collateral damage, while Superboy's creation and existence was justified with how Project Cadmus was made present in both the Doomsday story and in the funeral story. John Henry Iron Steel was someone who just showed up not only with a retcon in backstory, but also with zero intentions in wanting to replace Superman. He wanted to do good with a meaningful life that he wanted to honor Superman for having saved his life. AKA he was and is everything that Miles Morales should be as a replacement Spider-Man. Compared to Steel, Superboy and the Eradicator were then placeholders and products of the 90s, with the former being like a self-insert for the younger fans, and the latter being the 90s anti-hero. There is also some values dissonance with how Superboy's relationship was done with Pana, as she was clearly an older woman with a career, and Superboy was 
physically a newly born clone resembling a 16 year old. And when I decided to look up this map from when I covered the Judas contract with Terra and Destro, the state of Delaware, where Metropolis is usually located in, has the age of consent be at 18 years of age. Meaning that this kind of relationship could not be taken seriously unless it was a part of a hate manga. Then with the Eradicator, the point where it is said that he was the reason why and how Superman ended up being resurrected unintentionally is something that should be studied more. Because the method of placing him into the regeneration matrix at the 11th hour while 0.01% alive as the power source for Eradicator that then slowly restored Superman back to life was a one in a billion shot that was both invented slash made up for this story. When you look at it being a pre-planned story element on the writing team always planning to bring Superman back, it ended up creating a predicament for future writers to undo character deaths. Which, unlike Superman's resuscitation, would deserve a whole video on its own to talk about. But in a TLDR version, is it really even living when you're brought back from death on a borrowed time just to wait to expire again eventually? And now let's talk about the other real question of why the hell has the cyborg Superman not been used as an evil Superman when we have been oversaturated with stories where Superman himself is turned evil? This would also make him and Mongol Green Lantern villains. Oh. Because of, you know, Coast City. Hmm. We could have been saved from all those overdone evil Superman stories, if Cyborg Superman was used better as an actual Superman villain. Okay, what else should I acknowledge before watching how Peter Tomasi rewrote this story into the Decamo? Well, let's talk about that last part in the end, where this story's version of Supergirl, who was used to create a believable cover-up for where Clark Kent had been during all this. I actually brought this up previously at the end of my 5 videos long review on BBS 3 years ago before the Snyder Cut had come out, in criticizing how this was not in any way foreshadowed in that movie to set up his return to life in the Justice League movie, and then the Snyder Cut also didn't explain how Clark Kent is just walking around after Superman is resurrected in it. However, the news coverage does establish that Clark Kent has been missing for just over a month, which would suggest that the gap between BBS and either version of the Justice League movies was as long. Meaning that Lois Lane was always canonically pregnant to Clark as the result of the bathtub incident in BBS. That is the hill I'm willing to die on debating over that story element, but it is past winter snow with this subject, so let's watch that other animated movie now. Correction I must speak up is that unlike the Death of Superman movie, Peter Tomasi did not write this movie, but rather it was written by Tim Sheridan and our old acquaintance Jim Krieg. Which means that I need to get this on another thing out of the way while holding my stance as the Marty Ahtisaari standing between the Clois and Super Wonder Shippers. 
This movie came out back in 2019, aka three years into the DC Rebirth, where the new 52 Superman was killed off to make way for the post-crisis Superman taking his place. These two movies were so made to be something of an another transitioning phase for the Decamu to go from the new 52 to the Rebirth era. And knowing how it had ended up crumbling down at the time with writers like Tom King and Brian and Michael Bendis with the permission of Dandy Dio, that should have made it be a dead giveaway on how it was a bad idea. Meaning that this adaptation ended up suffering from that because it had to be set in the Decamu, and James Tucker leading the production team forced them to push in that off-screen breakup between Superman and Wonder Woman while practically forcing the audiences to accept Superman being with Lois Lane. I'm glad you came. I was hoping you could help me. I'm following... I never thought of us as rivals, you know. Are we? Kal-El and I had a special bond, but you were the love of Clark Kent's life. Y'all anyway, I feel for you. I'm relieved. So a good portion of, of like the, the the movies had Superman and Wonder Woman together as a couple. I'm here My for question it. is, I noticed that they broke up like off screen between Justice League versus Teen Titans right. and Death of. <laughs> now my question is, what was the decision making for like the, that decision? Because to me, that seemed a little jarring per se mm -hmm. when, when going from movie to movie. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm answering for James Tucker, right? Because again, yeah. I I was only sort of a you know I'm I'm the smaller producer on it, right? He's yeah. the the main mm -hmm. guy, right? Mm -hmm. He's the guy that basically orchestrates everything, and I'm I'm there to basically sort of help him, and I also mm -hmm. sort of I, I basically build it. And so the decision making for that was because of Death of Superman. It's because Death of Superman, it was an adaptation. The only way that James was comfortable taking the project, right? The, mm. the reason that it was to sort of, because it's the Death of Superman, Lois is such a huge part of it. They have to be in a relationship. It can't be Wonder Woman. Do you know what I mean? And so it became a thing because Reign of the Superman arguably is a um, Lois Lane story. Yeah, right? pretty and much. So again, Lois is like integral to this whole sort of part of the story. That, mm -hmm. So so it became a thing where, you know, again, just quite candidly, I feel like the whole New 52 thing was kind of thrust upon us. And I'm not sure that we were, you know, I think like in the beginning, this is before, you know, I, I came on and stuff like that. Like Wonder Woman was a very specific way. Mm -hmm. I think Superman was a very specific way and they were kind of unlikable. But mm -hmm. I think eventually they sort of morphed back into kind of like what traditionally Superman and Wonder kind of women were. It's always just business. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Where do you personally stand on the whole idea of Superman and Wonder Woman as a couple? <laughs> I'm I'm older and I'm more of a I'm, I kind of feel like you know fandom is this right it's mm -hmm. kind of like whatever your entry drug was or what your entry kind of thing is like that has always got a special place for you there right? you go that becomes the rock that everything is built upon and to paraphrase myself from that review I did over a year ago on a movie that DC just left to die and be forgotten Making Lois Lane look better than she actually is only ends up making her look worse and gives people like Jared more justifications to call her Lois Lane is Lois Lane. The bare minimum from her ascended role in this movie that I can see is justified is the absence of Supergirl, so she had to be written into her place. And with that out of the way, now let's talk about how the replacement Superman were portrayed in this movie. Steel is portrayed in a somewhat pass-actively similar way like in the comic, with Throne of Atlantis having been the establishment for when Superman saved his life. But his activities in going after the gangs using Toastmasters is given to the Eradicator in going after the intergang dealing with apocalypse and weaponry. Eradicator is then doubled down from a form of energy, reimagined as a hard light construct of the Kryptonian Data Matrix, which keeps him from being physically present at anything on bare minimum. 
also the part where in the comic Eradicator was using Superman in the regeneration matrix to charge himself. In this version, he was instead collecting solar energy and giving it to Superman's regenerating body, with him having also created the Fortress of Solitude between the two movies, since no other movie set in the Deca movie 4 had bothered to show it by being a Superman-related story. As for his personality, what little the Eradicator did have in the comic, is then reduced into being a robotic interface for Superman's ship. Superboy is streamlined from his early installment weirdness into a retro-styled version of his old self with Jeff Johns' changes built in. Tana, WGBS and Rex Leach are cut out, while Project Cadmus is reduced to just this one guy who is supposed to be Dr. Dubliex, by being named Dr. Daphne Donovan, who is just created to be killed off by Lex Luthor, who in this version got Superboy to sign up for his by being not doubly access boss. As Jeff Johns retconned Lex Luthor into being the other half of Superboy's DNA foundation, it was done here too, and the parent-child relationship between them is then pretty much like with a stage parent and a child celebrity. And finally, when it comes to the cyborg Superman, it has some of his scenes recreated with how he is playing his cards with Lois with him rescuing the stand in a president of the United States to gain her trust, and after also acknowledging his different design, that is where the similarities between the two cyborg supermen end, with Mongul having been written out in favor of Darkseid, because apparently they wanted to also make this movie be a stealth sequel to Justice League War. Darkseid also took the place of Doomsday's creator, along with all of his subjects, by claiming that he created Doomsday and sent it to Earth to kill Superman without the presence of Desad, Granny Goodness, Kanto, Birman Wunderbar, Steppenwolf, and even Glorious Godfrey is instead used in that human form that Young Justice overused. The power dynamic between them is the exact opposite opposite from what it was in the comic, because Darkseid is not Mongol who can be subjugated into an underling, so to remain as an adaptation, the cyborg Superman needs to have a last second takeover, so he can still be the final boss. In trying to get to that point, Superman's return back to life is... This is... Compared to how he woke up alone in the fortress, with just the robots, and then made his way to Metropolis while blind and deaf inside the war suite, and his first words out of it, over my dead body, is instead spoken off screen later when the cyborg Superman is threatening Lois who, I'll take care of you later, over my dead body. That's lame! That's a lame replacement for that line! which ends up feeling hollow, because their relationship does not have the same foundation as in the comic with Superman's past relationship with Wonder Woman. Again, why did these two movies have to be set in the Decamo, instead of being a standalone remake two-parter of the Superman Doomsday movie from 2009? Although I'm not sure if they would have kept the engine city with the destruction of Ghost City even then, because that would have led to Emerald Twilight, which WB Animation probably doesn't want to adapt. Or if they did with the Beware My Power movie in Tomorrowverse, I have not put time into watching it yet. I probably should. So the Engine City is replaced with a Justice League Watchtower being launched to the orbit, Mongols alien goons are replaced with humans conned into letting apocalypse technology infused with their bodies, the Justice League is boom to away during a prelude attack that earns Cyborg Superman his trust from the President, instead of gaslighting them away off planet from the upcoming conflict, 
Superman flies back to Metropolis on his ship instead of using the war suit. Cat Grant has been Get out! said Bimbo leads people into a let's go die together riot against Cyborg Superman and the Apocalypse converts. And Cyborg Superman feels incomplete by not having been in charge from the get go. Which is a shame, because the presentation with Patrick Fabian's performance really elevates the potential that this villain could have had in showing the actual in-universe evil Superman, who is not Superman third evil for the umpteenth time. This tender moment. Hank, you have to stop this. Darkseid is no longer your biggest problem. We're heads of its space. She tried to hide it, but I knew. I told her she'd be okay. We all would. We had Superman. Until we didn't. Until my ship and my crew were debris. And you weren't even dead yet! Okay, that technopathy is still here, but... All it was today already at how do we live in a world without Superman? Well, some of us already had to. Some of us watched as everything we had, everything we love, was lost. This. Superman turned me into this. Darkseid only rebuilt me and taught me how to wield my hatred as a weapon. Just like he done with Doomsday. That beast was only a mindless assassin. Well, I was set to mindless. That thing had a had destroyed had a, a, had a combat Superman. intelligence to know how to fight, where what to, what target to go after and how. This is between us, Hank. Let her go. Once we've left the exosphere, you and your gal pal will suffocate, freeze, and it's all your fault. It's almost poetry. But then there is how he fights Superman before he gets his powers back, and I can tell from looking at this fight if he is weak and holding back, or if Superman is more durable than he lets on. Then Superman gets his powers back by just having sunshine on him, Eradicator is instead used to delete Hank Henshaw's psyche from inside the cyborg Superman. The excuse where Clark Kent has been during all this time is alluded, but not properly explained when the movie establishes that he has been missing for... It's been six months. ...according to the movie's opening. And then the movie ends like how Forever Evil did with Lex Luthor inviting himself into the Justice League. So where do we go from here? Well, from those four Superman replacements, only Superboy and Steel have been properly recognized for the potential they have had. Steel made his other media appearance first in Superman the Animated Series, as well as getting that movie with Shaquille O'Neal playing him, and he has also appeared in Superman and Lois while dressed up like the Doom guy. Superboy took up until Jeff Johns had made his changes to the character before Smallville, Young Justice and Titans decided to use him in their ensembled cast. The Eradicator has also been recently used in Superman and Lois, while also reinventing him as Superman's brother. But the Cyborg Superman's cultural impact has not been as recognized as it has been for those three. Because apparently it has been easier to just make Superman himself be evil instead. Hank Kenshaw did make an appearance in the season 2 premiere for My Adventures with Superman, but I don't have faith in them doing justice for the character with him. And the version used in the Supergirl show was essentially put on a bus after the producers realized that David Harewood works better as Martian Manhunter. But as you might recall, None of them were used in the Superman Doomsday movie, which I will be covering next along with Wonder Woman Bloodlines, as I have been asked to go over that one after I covered the Wonder Woman 2009 movie. After them, my next comparison reviews will be including the Green Lantern Secret Origin with the 2011 movie with Ryan Reynolds and The Dark Knight Returns. And I also want to do a review on that game I streamed before I started working on this video, especially on how it represents my childhood with the movies. 
So while you wait for those videos to come out, like this video, comment what you have to say about Superman's return to life and the reign of his replacements, share this video for more people to see, and subscribe for those videos I just advertised to be coming out next. Also, ding the bell to be alerted for when I'm doing gameplay streams between script writing sessions for a chance to chat with me, and may your heart be your guiding key.